Hello, my very good friends. JP the third from Venus now, and we are back with more Suzerain. I'm gonna say like three different things there because we've had what can only be described or as was described by a literal legend, a happy accident. I will do my best to explain here. So, and my phone is going crazy as well. Let me mute this thing. So, I record these videos on a little system called OBS. And if you have studio mode on in OBS, you will see two screens, a, pre a preview screen of what you can show and then what's actually showing. This helps if you're streaming. If you're recording a video and OBS suddenly decides that it wants to show what you think you are going to show eventually in a stream, it's going to be a problem. So literally, I was halfway through this video. I was about 30, 40 minutes in. And I looked to the right to my second screen <laughs> to see, um, just to check the time. And I saw the screen for a promo for a live stream. And I just, I was like, what is that doing there? So we are, I had two options. I could have just um, started from scratch. We played about an hour and a half to two hours of game time. And re redo all of the uh, economic questions. But I decided to just roll with it. And I'll explain some of the decisions I've made to you here. Which may help overall. My explaining it over is just... Because it was, it was 30 minutes of me dryly explaining infrastructure and uh, autocracy and other things. So, let's go over the big notes. Well, I don't think this is the right screen for it. Here we go. So, there is a media conglomerate in Swordland called the Heart of Swordland. The new CEO is named Martha Caronte. He is the son of this man, Conrad Caronte. So, and again, there's no, there's no mistaking why he looks the way he does. He looks like uh, King Edward, or the guy who gave up the throne for just no particular, well, not no particular reason. He wanted to marry a particular woman, but that's a whole different story that's not for this stream. The point is, is that we had a phone conversation with Mr. Caronte, uh, and we were going to have a meeting with him in the next few turns uh, to discuss our relationship with the media. This is the mid-20th century. This is a world in the middle of a Cold War we would be, it would be understandable if we decided to, I guess, well, there's no way to say it, control the media. I was going to say, I was trying to think of a nice way to say it, but no. We can control the media because the Heart of Sorland controls most of the radio stations. Sorland today is a Heart of Sorland newspaper. It is one of the largest newspapers in the country. So... And I believe they also have editorial speak on the whole, support, whole, whole sword post. Lock of Times is relatively independent. But, yeah. So, the difference here is how you, if you control the media, that's your first real big step towards autocracy. That's when you say, I want to be a despot. I want to be a tyrant, and if I control the media, I will be, be able to... I'll be able to make my people happy. Essentially, if they never hear bad news from me, then they will have no choice but to be happy. But uh, we're taking the meeting out of politeness because, again, major conglomerate. We don't want to. We don't want to have a bad relationship with any of the business leaders on this particular route. But at the same time, we are we're reforming the country. We're taking a centrist route. We're, we want a good relationship with business. We don't want to be owned by any of the oligarchs or the Lothenberg group. So, oh, and I may have... I'm pretty sure I mentioned that the Lothenberg group in the last stream was the major economic uh, concern or cartel here. 
you know, where all the businessmen co- uh, get together and decide what they want to do. So that's our media strategy, and we'll be meeting with uh, Karanti in, in the next, within the next few turns. Um, let's see, what else do we do? Remind me, newspapers. Uh, that's our... Okay, yeah, we got the new assembly. We, yeah, we vetoed this. I mentioned in the last stream that this is a party line bill. Essentially, this is our chance to show that we're a party man and that we will put the good of the USP over the good of the country. It is not good for the country to have one party with a major financial and systemic advantage. Because again, at least for now, as long as, you get t- a t- as long as you've got a 10% threshold of the vote, the overall vote in the nation, you can get in the parliament. We are governing with 37% of the vote. And there are plenty of people who are just happy with that, to say the least. So... We have the inauguration ball coming up fairly soon. And we have also the spark and there's a nationalist violence coming. The uh, Young Swords uh, nationalist group are starting to cause some waves. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. With all that done, uh, we have decided to do a major infrastructure project. Um, I know which way I'm going. But let's go on lock of in and have this debate. The view towards the Marquian Sea from lock of in was nothing short of exquisite. The seaside estate, the seaside state of residence. I mean, both are acceptable, but sure. One of one is written one way, the other is written the other way. Fittingly named the Blue Mansion was large, fine, and accommodating. But enjoying the luxurious mansion wasn't the main reason of our visit. We gathered the economic team here to, here to discuss the new infrastructure investment project. Half an hour had already passed since the start of the meeting. Unfortunately, I didn't, did not even have the chance to have my usual afternoon coffee. <laughs> it's that kind of meeting. Looking at the view from the window, I let my mind drift for a couple of seconds. Simon's voice brought me back into the ongoing discussion. Mr. President, we need to focus on boosting the economy as quickly as possible. One of the fastest ways to achieve this is through infrastructure projects. What can we focus on? On one hand, businessmen are complaining about the slow logistic rail network between Holsort and Lockerman. Lilia started talking as soon as Simon took a breath. Because of course she did. On the other hand, citizens were criticizing the lack of a proper highway connection between Lockerman and Arbery. The narrow roads by the seaside are not only dangerous, but also difficult to traverse. We need to pick the most profitable, profitable option for economic growth, which is obviously connecting our two most economically powerful cities. It's not the business people that suffer, but the ordinary folk. What really matters, though, is that we can accomplish something tangible in your first economic act. We must prove our administrative capabilities. The people must know that this administration can get things done. I need to get a quieter mouth. (laughs) That that suddenly just went up. Like, if you look at the history of Venus Now on YouTube, it is full of just clicking. I should have bought a quieter mouse by now. Therefore, I define two important projects for your attention. The H3 Highway Project and the L1 High Speed Railway Project. And so Harvey positioned himself on a chair to take a more co- comfortable posture. The Ministry can only support one project at a time with the current capacity and budget. Let's move on to the details of each. So, which would you like to hear about first? Let's start with the Highway Project. The H3 project aims to improve the abyss. The, 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 yeah. The abysmal state of the road network in the Agland, Agland region between Agnolia, bordering Agnolia, excuse me. There is home to several million Agno Sordish and Sordish who feel neglected. There are no proper highway connections to and from Agland. 
The mayor of Arvry, Eric Neal, has, has been asking for a bigger budget to develop the regional infrastructure. He told us that even trucks are having a hard time traveling through the main roads. The increased traffic is causing trouble for people commuting in and out of the region. That must be cumbersome for the citizens. It is, bless their souls. I'm happy we're thinking alike on the matter. Let us look at the map. Now, this is like my only critique. Like, I wish instead of, this is gonna pop up and down the text box. I wish it would just stay right here <laughs> and let us look at the map. That would be preferable, but. I looked at the map. Lilius was pointing at Lockerbie. H3 Highway route starts here and leads to Lindkirk. So, here. From there goes to Arvory. Hmm. So, from Lockhaven to Linkburg to Arvory. Now, if you're paying attention to these, this uh, system of roads, it does link right to Ag. Agnolia. However, that is kind of it. <laughs> like, we have major road networks um, in our major economic regions, naturally, and it just kind of peters off from there. So, as a result, the road network towards the Agnolia capital Stellport will improve substantially. She paused and leaned forward in her chair. I thought a central government continuously neglected agno shortage dominated regions when I was mayor. Is this administration going to continue this, that kind of neglect? Negligence? I was close, I guess. We should make agno shortage citizens be respected as sorts like all of us. I am all for shortage citizens without separation or preference. Therefore, we should think about the country overall. It has to be pointed out that the highway, highway will be less beneficial in the near term. I have to disagree. It will increase the speed of transportation through the region. Our citizens would be quite pleased if we successfully accomplished this. Besides, if we enter trade talks with Agnolia, they would see the investment as a positive side. Uh, this is very interesting, but could you tell me about the railway project? Your predecessor, Alfonso, has failed to deliver on his campaign promise. But now we have the opportunity to start the construction of the groundbreaking railway project. As you know, our current trains cannot meet the standards of today. As many other countries adopt this new electric engine technology to power up their trains, we fall one step behind. I imagine that means they're using coal <laughs> or still steam or something, I don't know. News about the new electric trains in United Cantana has piqued the business interest. They too want to transport resources and material from Hallsort to Lockerbie with great speed and efficiency. This can also empower the businesses and bring investments. This should be our priority, growth and development optimization. Our plan is to upgrade the old L1 line from Hallsort to Lockerbie. It will transform to a high-speed rail. I looked at the map. Gus was pointing at Hullsort while Simon was looking attentively. The plan of construction starts right here at the capital. And we'll go to Enrica first. And then connect to Gelsort. See what I mean about the text box? But you can kind of see here. And all the tiny towns that will be more or less um, impacted by our developing this particular rail line. And then connect the Gill Sword. After which would reach Lockhaven, our economic powerhouse. The L1 will significantly boost, boost the economy on the newly linked cities and even the rural areas in between. Lockhaven is our primary port, so the goods unloaded there will be transported to Hull Sword much faster. Yes, we should link these rural areas in the middle with the, major, with the major cities of Sword. We are talking about the wealthiest regions and forgetting about Angland, which needs it more. The mayor of Enrica, Curtis L Curtin Lest, also requested this project to be prioritized. 
Businessmen in the region will be very content, which increases investments in employment. Therefore, I recommend the L1 high-speed rail project. I've settled on a decision. Excellent. What would be your final choice, Mr. President? Now, I mentioned this on the website when I was talking about the things I liked about this game. If you're taking this route, Gus and Simon are definitely the people you should be listening to. However, there is one slightly spoilery thing I'll add in here. You can get the H3 project done without investing in it right now. If you manage the highway, not the highway, but the railroad project effectively, it will create enough employment and, and enough room in the budget for the economic ministry or the, yeah, the economic ministry to just go in and do it anyway. The key words there are that, and Simon said, we can only do one at a time. So if you do one successfully and it helps bring the country out of recession, then you can do the next one. But the quickest way to get there is to focus on where your main economic power, your main economic authority and power are, if that makes sense. So if we build up, like, like Gus was saying, this is our major port and this is the capital. If we build these up, and yeah, we'll connect these smaller towns in between and that'll help those regions. But if we build that up first and foremost and reestablish Lockerman as a major port, then everything else can get done too. But trying to prioritize one particular region just because is not, it's, <laughs> at least in this playthrough, it's not smart. So that being said, I think my decision is obvious. <laughs> I decided on the L1 high-speed rail project to improve the connection between our most productive cities. That was the right choice, Mr. President. And the negotiations will begin in the middle of this year. You'll be able to award the contract to a corporation of your choice. The ministry estimates that the entire construction will finish in two years if every step, go forward, go, every step going forward is executed su su ah, successfully. I can English. Thank you all for your contributions and thoughts. Have a good day. See you soon, Mr. Rain. Have a nice day, Mr. President. See that disrespect? Don't forget who your president is, Lilius. Evening settled on the beautiful coastline of Lockerman. All right. So, a couple of smaller notes here. The journal keeps track of everything. Kind of giving you a greater idea of which way you're going. I do want to note this part up here, um, this particular ticker for economy, budget, and wealth. The wealth is our personal wealth, how much money we have at any given time. And we will have several options to use our personal wealth. <laughs> Don't want to get too far into it. But it's important that we keep a generous amount of money on hand uh, for when we ha feel the need to spend it. The budget are the, uh, what we can spend on major projects and options. We do have the option to deficit spend. We have that option. However, that'll take us deeper into the red. And if anything happens at all, economically, once we're in the red or at a certain point, it'll crash the economy for good. So we can only spend so much. However, um, kind of going Keynesian on this one keeping in track with our centrist reformist roots, we will inevitably, there will, I'll show you our economic strategy when we get there, but there will be a moment where it'll benefit us to do a little spending, a uh, little spending over what we're bringing in, just for the short term. And it's not where you think, uh, or I'm gonna, I'll point out when we get there. And the economy is in the red, so what are you going to do? With all that said, speaking of, a personal investment opportunity has been relayed by Mr. Manger, an experienced stock broker in Ventry City, Arcadia, is selling valuable shares in Armadine Industries. We read about that in the last one. We are going, you, now, this is a good investment. You can go big on that one if you choose to. However, hmm. 
I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to cry here because I'm trying to remember the exact sequence of events that, that are about to happen to us. Yeah, if I remember everything correctly, the smart thing to do is just to do one. So, well, if not a major investment, however, it'll benefit us in the long run. Now, let's go to our inauguration. We've been working long enough already. I had just finished bundling up my suit jacket when the doorbell rang. The presidential guard had arrived to pick us up for the inaugural ball. The ball was a three-decade-old tradition, breathless, breathlessly anticipated by politicians, bureaucrats, and the press. All eyes were about to be on me. I called on Monica to get the children ready. Looking in the mirror, I straightened my tie and took a deep breath. After tonight, there would be no turning back. Suddenly, Deanna hugged me from behind, startling me a little. Monica had fixed her hair into an elaborate braid, woven through with ribbons. Papa, Mama told me it's time to go. Now, this is um, the most underrated part of this game for me is they don't they not only give you options of how to be a president, but also how to be a husband and a father. So your your personal you can manage the country and your personal relationships at the same time. We've already um, made certain decisions in the name of power. So I've always found it, just in the different places I've done and picking different choices here, I've found it more fulfilling to be as decent as I can be. You know, firm, but reasonable. I, I don't know. That's just me. I doubt I'll have a family to test this theory on, but uh, at least for as the brain of Ant and Rain. This is how he's going to do his family while I'm in his brain. So, I stroked her hair. You could be president yourself someday. You know that? Only when I'm old like you. She giggled. It was almost time to leave. The big ball was starting in less than an hour. Now, where is my first lady? Monica came down the stairs. She was wearing a simple yet elegant beige sheath dress and short heels. They had been neatly pinned into a shingon. Shing, shingon. Shingon? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Showing off the pro earring that I had given her on our 15th anniversary. All those years, she had stayed by my side. Now we were about to begin the most challenging chapters in our lives yet. How do you do, Mr. President? <laughs> Just stand there and look at her. I pulled her into a deep embrace. Monica, my love, you look as gorgeous as the day we married. Now there's that charm that got you elected. Franz Frank trudged down the stairs. Oh, Frank, Frank I'm sorry. Like. <laughs> You're not the first kid who suffered mild neglect from their parent being a politician, and you won't be the last. I just think it's just... Fr Frank turned, tugged, at his collar with, uh, tugged at the collar of his new tuxedo. He seemed ill at ease. T don't make me wait again. Are you good to go, Frank? Like, you could be like a legitimate tyrant with Frank. Like, or Frank. Frank, Frank, Frank. I'm going with Frank. I'm still going with Frank. You, you could be a tyrant with the boy. You really can. And like the earlier cho choices show, you can be, you can be fairly misogynistic as well, if you decide to be. So it gives you, the, and what I like about this game is at least with those options, they would have fit with the time period. My actions as Rain right now are fairly off the time period. It's not... <laughs> Certainly there were fathers like this in the 1950s and 60s, but they were far more authoritarian, especially the deeper you went into Eastern Europe. So... Uh, there is the opportunity. That, that is one where you can go realistic, 
or you can um, ease up. So there, there really are there. There's definitely a right and a wrong there, but it's different. Yes. The sooner we go, the sooner it'll be over, right? Papa, are these people going to be around us from now on? She pointed at the presidential guard at the door of the house. These people are our friends, Diana. It's all right, baby. They're here to make sure nothing bad happens to your papa or his family. Monica held Diana's hands. Together, flanked by the guards, we walked out the door. Halfway to the car, Fong stopped abruptly and turned to me. Dad, do I really have to go? Can I stay at home instead? <laughs> it's a party stone for me! Surely you... <laughs> Surely you loved me enough after I left you alone with your mother during your formative years to come to this party held by your father. <laughs> I love these lashes. Don't make me angry, boy. I'm nervous myself, Fong. But I feel a lot more confident with my son by my side. Fong smiled reluctantly. Well, when you put it like that, sure, let's go. The presidential guard showed us the way as red and blue light flashed around us. Sergey, my driver, ushered us into our armored limousine. The motorcade started moving towards the palace. I gazed out the window, deep in thought. Anton, what do you think about? Nothing. Nice car, isn't it? I was thinking that we've come a long way together, haven't we? Yes, we have. And there's still so much that we'll accomplish, side by side. Just remember, no matter what happens, the children and I will always be here for you. I'm going to help Papa fix everything. Frank rolled his eyes. I know you will, honey. This means a great deal to me. After what seemed, seemed like just a few minutes, the convoy slowed to a halt. Sega rolled down the limousine soundproof partition. We are here, sir. Hope you enjoyed the drive. Much appreciated. How are you today, Sergey? I am just as good as I can be, but today's your day, sir. I'm glad you are in charge now. You know, my entire family voted for you. Thank you, thank you, and your family. I'm here with all of your support. No reason to thank me, sir. You are the one who sparked a glimmer of hope in us all. Sergey opened the door for me. The normally imposing palace was festooned with gar garish banners that nearly made it look cheerful. A line of shiny luxury sedans stretched around it. Politicians, bureaucrats, and celebrities, the creme de la creme of the sordid, Swordland elite, streamed inside the building. Good luck out there, Mr. President. I'll see you on the trip home. I sat out and immediately found myself surrounded by loud voices and camera flashes. Hordes of eager journalists thrust their portable microphones my way. My guards fended up most of them off, but one woman managed to dodge them and corner me. I recognized the Swordish Broadcasting Company logo on her press lanyard. Mr. President, Mr. President, do you plan on working together with the opposition parties on the expected constitutional reforms? <laughs> if, the opposition, if, if the opposition is willing to support us. Mr. Ritter clarified that as long as you hold your promises hold your promises of dem democratization, excuse me, they will support you on these issues to the end. What do you think about that statement? Mm. <laughs> I'm gonna go like, there are, there are different ways you can go about it, but I'm gonna go with, with the, like there is, Game face, idealistic. Oh, pick this one. But the pol politician JP is like, no. Whenever you haven't actually sat down and read what somebody said, don't comment. I can't comment since I haven't seen the statement yet. Like that's all. That's always the best possible answer. Never do it. Like, I don't know if anybody's planning to run for office in their home country, but the best political advice I can give you is that if you have not seen or read a statement for yourself, do not comment on it, because you have no idea if the report is telling the truth or casting it in the correct light. 
One more question. When your first act at pre one of your first acts as president was to veto a campaign finance law that would have deprived small parties of public funds while increasing those channels to your own. Are we seeing the beginning of a more egalitarian administration? I just didn't want to cause too much of a stir on my first day. That's a good that's a good witch to, to demure there. But we still the reality is, and I'm gonna this one I'm gonna explain. Because two and three are good options. One is just, again, it's, if you just want to go hardcore, you can. Uh, two is a great olive branch to the other parties that you will need. Like, you'll need the PFJP and all the independents you can get. However, you also need the bulk of your own party to vote for you. And the conservatives have the most seats. So, um, the best way to do this is to kind of demure. And, uh... Just kind of brush it off. At least on this route. Like if you want to go full on. Uh, full on democratic. Uh, liberal democrat reign. You certainly can. I just didn't want to cause too much of a stir on my first day. That's enough man. Said one of the, my guards while nudging the reporter away from me. A path toward. A path through the crowd was now open. And we quickly made our way to the entrance of the palace. At the same time a dozen fireworks went off. The entrance was decorated with, a be with beautiful ribbons in assortment colors of white, yellow, and maroon. A lush maroon carpet had been rolled down the stairs. We entered the lobby and joined the throngs of people making their way towards the ballroom. Behind me, I heard a familiar, ver a familiar voice. First voice. There they are, the most beautiful family in Sorland. Uncle Peter. Hi, Uncle Peter. It's great to see you. You two are growing faster than I am getting wiser. You're sorry for sore eyes, Peter. Likewise. Happy to see a familiar face, Peter. Evelyn. Peter's wife Evelyn approached us and shook our hands with a firmness that belied her delicate features. Evelyn. Congratulations, Anton. I have to say, the results were clear to me from the beginning. I wish I was as sure as you. Now that's the truth. Thank you. We both worked hard to make it happen. We know you did. You deserve the position. And tonight we reap the rewards. Yes, I definitely need a celebration after all of that. I know you do. Oh, Monica, how are you? You've barely said a word. I'm more relieved to have this roller coaster ride over with. But of course, not a real work begins. Ah, yes. Managing the help, planning parties, daily trips to the salon to look your best for foreign dignitaries. <sighs> Don't be so old-fashioned, Evelyn. I plan to use my powers first lady to advance the position of women throughout Sorland. Equal rights for our sex are long overdue. Wouldn't you say, Ant? <laughs> as long as you don't burn the roast. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure I don't want to get kneed in the groin on my inauguration ball. That's my wife. Never content to be just a pretty face. Like I, like I said, I love these options. And it, it all goes towards the manner that you treat your family and friends with, which is awesome. Absolutely. We'll work together to achieve that. Monica flashed me a smile. I earned some points for that one. You're welcome, Matt. Deanna suddenly jumped in between us and turned my sleeve. Papa, can we go? I want to see the ballroom. Yes, it's time. Let's go. We left the lobby and made our way towards the ballroom. Inside, we were yet again surrounded by a noisy crowd, but this time it was the politicians who sought to appease the new authority in Sorton. I spent the next few hours shaking hands, joining various conversations, some serious, some superficial, and making speeches. We finally settled down at our dinner table with the Vecterns as the band started playing some slow jazz tunes. Whew, that was tiring. We have to get used to it. Well, suddenly, a loud banging noise echoed from outside the ballroom. Then another, and another. The musicians stopped playing. Everyone in the room looked around in confusion. Peter and I turned towards each other. Realization drawn, drawn, dawning. Wow. Realization dawning on both of our faces. Fireworks? No, gunshots. As soon as Monica heard the word, she lunged from her seat. I threw my cell phone, Monica, Deanna, and Frank to shield them. Papa, what is that? Papa, what's happening? 
I knew it. We never should have gone. Cows broke out of some guests, flung themselves under their tables, and others ran towards the door, screaming. Diana burst into tears while Frong tried to comfort her, hiding the fear in his own eyes. Three more gunshots rang out loudly. Mr. President, are you all right? Carl Greither, head of, head of the Swordish Police Force, was running towards us with three more police officers in decorated uniforms. They all had their guns drawn. As soon as he made it to us and saw that we were unharmed, he, he let out a big sigh of relief. Thank God. Check the perimeter. He turned around quickly to his men. Check the perimeter, now! Paul, Jansen, follow my lead. We'll bring them to the safe room. He turned to Monica, Evelyn, and the children and spoke in, spoke in a softer voice. Do not worry, the situation is now under control. Please follow me. We probably followed Carl through the winding halls and corridors of the palace. His men still had their guns drawn, which did nothing to ease the tension. On the way, Peter made an attempt to break the silence. <laughs> Peter's like, Peter's such a bro. It's not the time, but he is a bro. What a fucking night. It's not over yet. Carl turned us with a serious face as we were about to round the corner. Quiet, please. Sorry, I talk when I get nervous. Peter, shut up. <laughs> Or, I guess she would have been a little bit more intense. Peter, shut up. Carl flipped the switch on the wall and the panel opened, revealing a hidden staircase leading to a large reinforced door. Inside, a set of alert emergency lights flickered on. The safe room was comfortable and spacious, with expensive-looking leather sofas. Small security monitors on the wall displayed, a grainy f a displayed grainy footage of each room in the palace. There was a boardroom and a pantry containing enough provisions to last us months. This is actually a... Uh, this is actually a Chekhov's gun situation with this room. I don't want to spoil too much, but if you make the wrong decisions, all of this will come into play later on. But we'll leave it there. Monica and Evelyn sat, with the, ch sat the children down and started wiping their tears. Carl stepped away from us and made a few radio calls. When he was done, he returned to me and Peter. Not the best inauguration ball I've been to. This is just panicking. This is just ridiculous. We're going to be calm and reasonable. Leadership. So, what's the status? Carl's radio suddenly crackled to life. Every second felt like an eternity as he pressed his ear to the, re ear to the, as he pressed his ear to the receiver. When it fell silently, he turned to us. Good news. We're not in any danger at the moment. The situation has been dealt with and the perimeter has been secured by the guards and the police. He glanced towards Monica, Evelyn, and the kids. If I may, sir. He, he gestured towards a more private corner of the room and started speaking more quietly. This is what we know so far. We have confirmed that two people were gunned down in front of the palace. The attacker is one of them, and we have reason to believe he was working alone. He fired three shots at an MP, one to the head, two to the body, instantly killing him. Presidential guards at the palace immediately shot and killed the attacker. He has not yet been identified and will require an investigation. The MP that was killed was identified as Bernard Circus. This is huge, Anton. This will cause a lot of problems. A lot of problems. Peter pulled two cigarettes and handed me one. He turned to Evelyn. I could hear him trying to reassure her that everything was going to be all right. Monica was still trying, trying to tend to Deanna and Frank. Deanna at Frank paced the room, mumbling that he should have stayed home. I sat down beside my wife and children. Uh, I should have just smoked alone. I forgot this option. I, I clicked that too fast. Because both of these are lies. We are safe. I'll make sure everything is going to be fine. We can't be sure of anything anymore. And I lit my cigarette and took a deep drag. She's right. <laughs> I was going to see this through and keep my family safe. At all costs. I crashed a cigarette on the ashtray. So... This will require minor explanation. Rain open to talk. This is the yeah, signal possibility of cooperation with Friends Victor. Good. MP shot. Sorlin has been shot by Grave News today as an elected member of parliament has been shot dead in a suspected political assassination. 
Police sirens were heard around the clock today as the Hulso police force increased security measures across the, around the Capitol. The fact that such a violent act happened at the heart of the Capitol during the new president's inauguration celebration has worried many citizens. The Red Youth have reported, has reported to have promised revenge. This seems, to, this seems like it has the potential to, to be a spark that would swirl swirl and into the, into the political violence of the 1920s. And this is what I mean. Like, this is what makes this game so good because for us... Since we lived through the prologue, <laughs> this is not like a dis- this isn't a, di- a distant memory for us. We we know what those days were like. I I'll, I'll also note here who Bernard Circus was. Let's see. Here we go. Bernard Bernard Circus. A Swedish poet, novelist, short story writer, and politician. He's acclaimed for his lyrical flow and regarded to be the leader of the Swedish avant garde. His early writings were heavily influenced by the social, cultural, and economic problems of his home city of Dyer. His work earned him the description of a romantic communist. This is a thing. Like, it's not so much of a thing in America or the United States because we. Beyond our capitalist instinct, it's very hard to envision the ideal form of a communist or Marxist version of America. I'm sorry, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I may be showing a little bit of my own hand there, but it is. But if you go to, if you look at the writings of Eastern Europe or Southeast Asia or definitely Central and South America, definitely Cuba, my God. A lot of their artistic culture, especially around the times when communist revolutions started happening, had a sort of romanticism about it that you just don't get with the free market system. I'm sorry, the best we've done is the wealth of nations. Like, we don't. <laughs> Us capitalists just don't do romanticism very well. I'll read his bio a little bit more before we get, because we have some security briefings we're going to have to get to in a minute. But I really like, like, I, my only wish is that, like, hopefully in, like, a DLC, they'll do a prelude of what he did before, because I would like to see them attempt some communist romanticism, or romantic communism. He joined the Red Youth during the sort of Civil War. Uh, more than likely, if we join the Red Youth, we will be friends with Circus. And Flint Sorlin after the war was over, surviving the purge of Tarkin Saul. He moved to United Cantana and studied sociology at the Communist University of uh, Kuo. There he was influenced by the artistic experiments of Cantanan poets who advocated futurism as well as the ideological vision of Malinyev. Malinyev. I got it. Many of his works are regarded as the great, greatest achievements of the Swedish literature and earned him many wars abroad. Because of his political views, his works have been banned in Sortland since 1930. In 1950, Bernard returned to Sortland following the departure of Tarkin Saul. He organized strikes against the Swedish government's failure to include amnesty laws and started to become a popular figure in Swedish politics. He ran as an independent in the 1953 general elections and became the first communist to be elected to the Grand National Assembly of Sortland, which is why Peter said that this was a big deal. An extraordinarily big deal. Now, with all that done, sorry, I'm trying. To, I'm trying to center it, but it, it's just going to center itself. Start with the reports here. Security measures at the Capitol have been heightened after the murder of Bernard Circus, or Circus, of course, and they're opening up an investigation. All right, so we got um, the moon in the Situation Room was gloomy. They're the same night, like, something like this isn't going to happen without, like, a big cabinet meeting. And then, like, a security cabinet meeting, then a meeting with the security personnel themselves. Like, we're going to be up a while. Now, we're not with the game, though, but I'm just saying that that's what would happen in real life. My cabinet members were gathered to discuss the shooting outside the palace. Lilius presented the initial report. Bernard Circus was shot dead at 9.03 p.m. in front of the palace gates. He was an elected independent member of the assembly and, as you know, a famous communist. She spat out the last word with some distaste. 
if it isn't clear by now, Lily is, is a solace. Like, she's a nationalist. So she is on the exact opposite end of Bernard Circus. However, we do have some communist members. Because the United Sordland is such is a unity party and it has several different wings, um, there, are, there are communists in this cabinet. There's no other way to say it. There are, there are definitely hardcore Marxist and communist here. Now, whether or not they're going to be a part of the big security briefing meeting, meeting, meeting. <laughs> Sometimes even I'm shocked by what I say. But that's another matter. The guards at the scene were 50 meters away and immediately took action by responding and killing the assailant, who was identified as a member of the nationalist organization, Young Swords. The president and his family were unharmed, praise God. What were the motivations behind such a horrid act? Our investigators are suspecting a political are suspecting a political assassination since the young Soros have been threatening the communists for some time. This is a dangerous atmosphere where the left versus right political violence of the 1920s might spark once again. This seems like <laughs> this hits differently now. I'll be honest with you. The last time I did a full playthrough of this game was right, it was um, last December, right after the general elections in the United States. And literally, in within a few months of putting out the review of it, we had the insurrection in, at the Capitol in Washington, D.C. So... This hits differently now. Like there was a time when I could have got behind this microphone and said, I can't imagine being in this situation. I can now. I can now. A return to those days would be devastating. The coups are the reason why our country stagnated for a decade. Neil Morgna, the Minister of Justice, sighed. The Red Youth have condemned the killing. But didn't stop them, didn't stop there. They promised revenge. This will in turn spark further aggression from the young swords. The whole cycle started because Bernard Sarkoff expressed his, expressed his views. We can't simply look away. Mia had always been one of the only members of the Justice Ministry truly deserving of the name. She had survived countless attacks on her character while fighting corruption within the Ministry and rising to power had only compounded her sense of moral duty. Freedom of expression is part of our constitution. We can't have anyone, let alone an MP chef, for voicing different opinions. Now, I mentioned this in the prologue when we were going through it, that if you picked a side in the early days, it will come back to haunt us. This is what I'm talking about right here. If you had picked one side or the other, um, different sides of your cabinet, the nationalist sides and the uh, communist circles, they will use that as a weapon against you if you attack one of these different political organizations. So this is one of the, one of the areas, unless you want to go, like if you want to have a Marxist regime or a nationalist, nationalist regime, Picking one side or the other will help. But if you don't, one of the smartest things you can do is walk a narrow line and just bring the hammer down on everybody, which I think is what we're going to do. I fully agree. We should protect freedom of speech. Our laws do, and for good reason. Silencing voices only results in fear and stagnation inside society. We had that before. And know very well how it was. I hear your concerns. Our police do the best, their best to uphold the rights of our citizens. We will prevent such an act from happening again by making sure our security measures are reevaluated. Minister of Defense Joseph Lancia grunted in approval. He towered over the rest of us in full military uniform, his many war medals conspicuously on display. Like, dude, you're a civil. You're a, the only way you could have got this job is if you were an MP. Time to hang up the uniform. Agreed, ma'am. Our gendarmerie 
will also help boost security in the rural areas where possible. There might be more to come. Gendarmerie? I'm gonna go, yeah, I think it's gendarmerie, not gendarmerie, but. We should, we should refrain from making the issue a political one from the start. We'll only add fuel to the fire. You're right. We need to calm the situation. Our government is capable to is capable to maintain security. Our job will be to reduce tensions. Several police cars rushed past the Maroon Palace and everyone went silent. Regardless, a full investigation on all involved parties is underway. We will find the subversives and punish them soon enough, Mr. President. I'll do my best to help coordinate the administrative task. Now, this is something I mentioned uh, it, I think it was the. I, I think it was the things that I liked about the game, where the vice president is really more of a PM. That is one thing I would change with the game. I would have just make uh, Peter the prime minister, not the vice president. I know, I understand why they did it that way, but um, I think it's closer, especially as you see his task um, in the game move forward. It's a little bit closer to real life to have um, a prime minister in place of a vice president. But that's just me. I don't want to, like, that's just me. I'll leave that alone. Justice will be served and the rule of law will return to this country stronger than ever. Only if we stay vigilant as a country. We must, we must think about the upcoming budget. Now, this is interesting. Well, this is mildly interesting, and I'll, um, I won't go too deep into it. But it, it's in our interest to keep Lancio on our side. We don't always have to agree with him or give him what we want. But if we defer to him enough, that'll be a positive for us in the future. Because we want, we want him... He's got his full military regalia on and everything. He's a guy stuck between two worlds. He's both an MP and a member of government, as well as a member of the military general staff and a soldier. So what we're doing here, we're not agreeing with him, but we are deferring just a bit. I agree. Internal stability must be maintained. Our security funding might need to be increased. I'm sure the Minister of Interior has already taken the necessary precautions. We can be assured that our police units and intelligence units are on increased threat condition. Nobody should be able to move a finger against government officials. Lucian took some notes after checking the latest newspapers and reports. It seems that the tensions between the communists and nationalists will escalate further. It will be very difficult to pass any meaningful change if there is chaos in the country. We can't pass any constitutional forms in such an atmosphere. No use worrying about it now. Let's analyze the effects first. We'll cro we will cross that bridge when we come to it. That will be it for today, then. We will convene again soon. Thank you all, and keep us updated. The meeting concluded, and the ministers left the room with concerned looks. It's hard to anticipate what would happen next. All right. We'll check the papers right quick. The Radical hasn't um, reported in yet, but they have a fairly beautiful, uh, because of course they're a Marxist leftist organization, they have a fairly beautiful um, obituary for Mr. Circus. Breaking news, Bernard Circus, a prominent MP known for his communist romanticism, has been murdered, leaving the Maroon Palace grounds after the inauguration ball of Anton Reen. Reports indicate a politically motivated assault by the far-right nationalists of the Young Swords, Shocking photographs have been leaked to the press showing blood dripped stairs of the Maroon Palace. We heavily condemn this sort of political violence. This is the very cycle the president must break with reforms. Agreed. A few days later. So we're going to have a lot to do. Um, 
I think what I'll do is, let me see. Yeah, the radical is updated. So I'll end it by reading the radical. We'll have a lot of reports. Then we have a security briefing. And we'll pick it up in the next stream with a security briefing, going through all the notes and the communications from across the world and across the country. We'll have a lot of work. In the next stream, we're going to have a lot of work because the uh, celebrations are over. Like the introductory chapter is done. Now we're getting into kind of the grid of it. But if I remember correctly, this is actually fairly beautiful. So yeah, let, yeah let's end with, end with this. Farewell, Bernard Circus. It is a sad moment for Sorland. We have lost a renowned poet who not only wrote about the struggles of the working class, but also acted on them. However, his decision to enter Swordish politics was met with a sick attack that ended his life. This was indeed intended as a message to all opposing voices in Sorland. We, the team here at The Radical, condemn this evil act of terror of the young swords, who we believe to be held, must be held accountable as a whole group. It is finally the time for the government to realize this organization as a terrorist threat and serve the justice that is long due. Bernard Sarkis is always going to be in our hearts as a great Swordish poet, as a revolutionary, as the leader of the Swordish avant-garde, as a futurist, as a romantic, as a millennialist. Mal I will never get that right. But beyond all, as a symbol of freedom of speech. He is now a man who was murdered for speaking his mind. This cannot remain as yet another political murder of the sad reality of Sorland. In fact, it's time to change this. It is time to speak up as people. The most beautiful sea has yet to be crossed, said the great poet, reminding us to always have hope. We must strive to have hope and to make them a reality. It is the best way to honor his memory. Bernard Circus will be laid down in dire tomorrow. Any citizens who wants to pay respects, who wants to pay respects, is invited to attend. So if if that didn't sell you on the writing of this game, I don't know what will. But we're gonna we're gonna call it there at least for um, this stream. When we pick it back up, we are going to be very very busy. Leave a like if you are enjoying the content. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't thus far. And do check out vnsnow.com. we got a lot of content coming this July. We would love to have you there with us as we... Um, I don't know how to put it other than just shilling my, <laughs> my content. But yeah, we, I would love to have you guys read it and hopefully you'll enjoy it. I'll catch you in the next one.